Members, I had the uh, uh, I, I had the opportunity to go out to Pacer Center. Uh, gosh, was that last year or t two years ago? I can't I recall. It two. Um, to take a look at adaptive technology, specific um, to the conversations we're having, and it it's something that I. Um, Depending on the uh, outcome of the special election, since we're at a 33-33 tie uh, in the Senate, and uh, 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 how the committees uh, uh, end up being, you know, shaking out, uh, it would be my in intention to try to schedule something early in the session to go out and see Pacer Center uh, and uh, uh, maybe get a little bit more in depth on assistive technology, adaptive technology, but. It made a big enough uh, impression on me that I thought we should have uh, some discussion of it here at the in, in, in a larger sense, and then we can we can dive in later. So, uh, thank you uh, very much for for uh, coming today. Uh, please state your name for the record, and uh, feel free to begin your testimony when you're ready. Chair Pratt and members, for the record, my name is Jody Manning and I'm the director of PACER's Parent Training and Information Center, and I've been with PACER Center for 14 years. Good morning, Mr. Chair. My name's Don McNeil. I'm a father first of three children, Megan, Evan, and Ethan. Megan with Williams Syndrome, Evan a first year medical student at Dartmouth. Our son, Ethan, is recently a grad of 196 school district with severe autism. I am also an attorney by day, and then I am um, on the board at the Pacer Center. So I'd like to share some information for those of you who might not be familiar with Pacer Center. Uh, Pacer Center was founded in 1978. Uh, originally, there was one program. That's the program that I'm the director of, the Parent Training and Information Center. And it was founded on the principle of parents helping parents. So at that time and still today, all of the advocates who work on um, the team that I am on are all parents of children with disabilities, and I'll explain more about that later. Um, since that time in the 40 years that have passed, we now have almost 40 programs at Pacer Center. And in developing new programs, we've tried to respond to needs that we've seen in the field. So it um, might be important for you to understand that on the national level, PACER has a national, we house the National Bullying Prevention Center, and we also house the National Center, Parent Center on Transition and Employment. Um, in addition to that, we have the Simon Technology Center that Chair Pratt mentioned earlier, and we would definitely welcome all of you to come. We'd love to give you a tour and see what we do there. In addition to that, we have a health information center and a children's mental health project that I think would be of most interest to you to know about. In all of the work that we do at Pacer Center, we provide our services for free on many different levels. That oftentimes is one-to-one -one assistance to parents and school staff on occasion as well, I will say. And that could occur via phone, in person, or on e via email. We develop a number of resources, um, at least one that I'll hope to share with you today, um, in writing for parents. They're in parent-friendly language. We write our materials at about the eighth grade level so that we know that it'll be easily understood by the wide population. Those are available in print or free downloads on our webpage. And then lastly, we do a great number of presentations. If you look at our website, you'll see that we are oftentimes presenting somewhere in the state two to three times a week, every week. Um, and we do those presentations in person or via webinar so that we can hit a target audience. Um, so I just wanted to familiarize you with our organization. We are a nonprofit and have been around and redeveloping for uh, quite some time. Mr. Chair, uh, again, my name's Don McNeil. I thought it'd also be helpful to give you a little bit of my street credibility on some of the issues that you're talking about. Um, once my daughter was diagnosed in 2003, um, the legislative body was faced with some budget crisis and you created a, uh, the body created a parental fee requirement in order to receive support services. That parental fee in a parent's view was just a surtax in order to qualify and receive benefits, we have a deal with the state where we pay an additional percentage of our income in order to keep our children um, receiving support. 
Now, it would be, the deal was it would cap out. If we didn't use services, we didn't have to pay the full amount of the fee, but you get the idea. It was to, in essence, discourage the use of those tax dollars unless you really, really needed them. I wasn't really happy with that because I had a child with a disability who really needed that support services, so I went to Pacer Center to Paula Goldberg and said, this doesn't seem right. Why are we picking on the least among us when we have a budget crisis? So I became more involved with PACER over the years. And from that, um, because I'm an attorney, they quickly thought, well, Don, why don't we have you volunteer and spend some of your pro bono time working on a couple of task force? So in 2009, I served on the legislative task force at the invitation of, um, of Commissioner, um, at that time it was, um, now Judge uh, Jim, James Cunningham, to serve on the task force to analyze all the federal laws and all the state laws and see how state laws would exceed and then put together a GRED, which we painstakingly did over a number of meetings with a bunch of different members. And I have that Excel spreadsheet with me because it gets talked about all the time, but nobody stops to look at all that pro bono work that I did. And <laughs> in it, we had a coalition of people that came from the school board association. We had maesters there. We had parents there. We had school district attorneys. And we all came together once every few weeks and looked through all of those statutes and said, do we really need some of these state statutes? Do they really exceed? Let's make some unanimous recommendations to the legislature. Well, we did that. So from that, here's an example that I bristle about as an attorney. There was a view years ago that there's too much litigation. The attorneys are driving the narrative of what we should be doing. So let's get rid of the litigation. We created in our state a conciliation process, mediation, get the parents and school districts to work together and work it out before the attorneys get involved. That exceeds the federal minimum requirements. But when you hear people talk broadly about how we have too much regulation in our state, that's the one area that, as attorneys, we look at it with pride because even though you're not going to help pay for my students, my son's medical school education, we've gotten rid of most of the litigation in, in Minnesota. Over in Wisconsin, it's different. Not only are they Packer fans, but they also have much more litigation than we do in our state. And it's because in one area where we exceed the federal minimums, we've come up with a conciliation process that works. That mediation, that ADR, is something that I looked at with all of my peers and colleagues as part of that commission and came back to the legislative body with our recommendation. So I have a copy of it. It's one of the things that it's hard to find online, but I still have all my notes from all those meetings with my three-ring binder. Well, no good deed goes unpunished. In 2013, to add to my street credibility, the legislative auditor issued a report and said we should look at caseloads. And then it, it also brought up, again, we exceed in our state the federal minimums, and we should look at it. I co-chaired with Todd Travis, and we had a group of people that got together um, over seven meetings over the winter of 2013, 2014, 16 members. Todd Travis is a wonderful man who's the director of special education at Midwest Special Education Cooperative, who brought a lot of insight from working with it every day. I brought my insight as a dad, as a lawyer, and as somebody who served on that legislative task force. So here's an example of how it works. When you brought all those people together, we came up with 29 recommendations and simple things that we thought would streamline it and make things better for everybody. Paperwork always gets brought up. It's one of the things we looked at. My volunteer work, I went down to 196, met with Mary Krieger and said, you know, why don't you sit down with me and show me where the paperwork's being generated from? And, and let's compare it as a lawyer to what the statute requires and what the rules require and what you're actually doing. Well, there's a big difference between what the law requires and I think Mace just alluded to it. It's a big difference in what the law says and what they're actually doing. Now, Again, I bristle as an attorney saying, oh, you're telling me that the lawyers are somehow or another creating that. I'll tell you, there's 17,000 attorneys in this state and only a handful of them practice in this area because there's no money in representing parents in special education litigation. First of all, there's rarely a lawsuit. 
because the conciliation process works. And then second of all, how are you going to get a parent who's already paying that surtax to come up with the cash to pay the attorney to go fight over whether you're going to get extra para time? It just does not happen. So when you look at what is driving paperwork, you ought to look a little bit deeper at whether that is being done for other reasons than what the easy to blame, we have too many state regulations. So after I did that work, here's a, a couple of things in there that I think they all have been adopted, but what generated that legislative auditor report in 2013 was a rule 3525.2340. And it's a grid that requires when you have a certain number of children with profound disabilities assigned to a school teacher, that school teacher gets a limit, a cap on the number of children that's going to be. So here's an example. Imagine if you're a school teacher in fifth grade and your principal says, I'm going to have to assign to you five children with severe EBD issues with your other 20 typical children. Good luck to you. Well, what's that school teacher going to do? They can't teach. So they don't trust their school board to keep that minimum. So the, le the caseload requirement limits that. Now, and when I co-chaired that committee, we had teachers as part of that committee. And the one thing they all talked about was not doing away with it, as the legislative auditor was suggesting we do, but to enhance it, make it more robust, because they wanted to be able to teach, and they did not want to be assigned too many children with profound disabilities all in one classroom. They wanted to be able to teach all of them. Now, as I talk a little bit about my street credibility, um, I'll, I'll, before I hand it back to Ms. Manning, I'll note this, that we often tell people. I have three children. When my parents told me that they loved us all equally, I never believed them. I have three children, I love them all equally. I've got one that's a med student. He thinks he may be the favorite, but he's only the favorite on a particular afternoon. But I also have a favorite <laughs> son that goes for a walk with me in the woods with our puppy his companion dog. I've got my daughter with the Williams syndrome who's the twins fan. She's my favorite too. I want them all educated to reach their full potential. Now everybody who sits in the gallery all come here with their different ideas. We're all trying to do the same thing. But I don't want you to do something too dramatic that's going to upset the apple cart that we've had in place for years that has worked. Minnesota continues to be not just the best place in the country to educate your children, but I contend the best place in the world to educate your children. And I'm just, my free advice is let's be careful before we do anything that's um, too dramatic with what we already have in place. Well, and let me just, uh, I had the uh, opportunity to meet with Mr. McNeil a couple of weeks ago and, and you know, I want to share with the committee what I, what I shared with Mr. McNeil is that I don't think the, at least I, I can speak for myself personally, the idea is not to do away with all the mandates that exceed federal law, right? I think what this has provided us is an opportunity to look at those and decide what are appropriate and what aren't. And so I just want to make sure that, that everybody understands that that's not the direction of the committee is to do away with and, and bring us down to the bare minimum of federal law, but to make sure that we're doing what's right for Minnesota students. And um, and so I shared that with Mr. McNeil, and I appreciate the work you've done. And we're going to continue to take a look look at the grid. Um, certainly, if you could provide copies for the rest of the, the committee, that would be uh, terrific. Um, but I just want to I, I just want to make that that blanket statement that that that's not the goal of the committee um, at all. Now, you know there are some there are some. Uh, uh, let's just say the effect of mandates uh, becomes a very, very blunt tool that tends to limit the, the uh, uh, flexibility of local school districts to, to implement services as, as, as they feel necessary. And I think we just heard from the MACE teachers that maybe some of the mandates are, are getting in the way and, and interpretation uh, of rule and statute are getting in the way of, of services. And so, uh, I, I just want to be very careful when we start talking, you know, saying the state auditor said we should do away with this mandate or do away with that mandate. Um, that's our job. We may put forward a bill, but we're going to have a very thorough and robust discussion before anything goes to the floor. Thank you. 
So like Mr. McNeil, my friend Don, um, I came to Pacer Center as a parent. I am the parent of a 31-year-old son with disabilities. He has ADHD, inattentive type, learning disabilities, and an inherited tremor disorder. For the fake sake of disclosure, you may notice that he inherited that from me, the tremors, so you'll excuse me. Um, my son um, needed help in school, and I begged and begged and begged for help. Um, he was finally given a 504 plan in middle school, um, but we had some teachers refusing to follow it. They weren't consistent with using the 504 plan, and things fell apart. And I continued to beg and beg and beg for support. Um, eventually, my son gained a new diagnosis. And as parents, we watched his self-esteem and self-worth plummet for a couple of years while we continued to beg. And our worst fear was realized when he was diagnosed with depression. And, um, was hospitalized and spent the first nights of his life away from us in middle school, spending the night in a psychiatric unit. And we were greeted by the school then saying, we can't take him back. We're going to do a quick evaluation and he needs to go to a level four program. I wish I would have known then what I know now. Um, because things didn't play out quite as well as they should have, and he continued to struggle emotionally for a couple of years. Um, finally, I had to make a big decision of quitting my job and leaving the field of nursing so I could keep him home with me and homeschool him for a period of time until he was feeling better. And I said to the school, he'll be back, and he'll be healthier, I promise you. And so in ninth grade, we knocked on the door again and said he's ready to come back, and we, he had an IEP. In the end, my son finished high school um, at a very competitive high school with a 3.87 GPA and went on to Rutgers University and graduated with honors. My story, though, as proud as I am of him, I think the relevance of my story is I think he's a perfect example of had he received those services earlier and gained those skills, he likely wouldn't have perhaps needed his IEP when he was in high school. He had it in high school. We're incredibly grateful for it. We think it led to a lot of his success. But we wouldn't have had to go down that road of the mental health had we had appropriate services. So when he was in high school, his senior year of high school, I decided that I was going to leave nursing, and I wanted to try to help parents who were dealing with the same situation that I dealt with. I wish I could say 14 years later, we don't hear that people are begging for help and not getting it, but that's not the case. I had heard your story, Chair Pratt, previously, and I had told you that in 14 years, I've never heard a parent say they want to provide my child services, and I don't know if I should take them or not. Never, ever. And you should know at Pacer Center, we get on average 1,200 calls a month. So again, I've, I've never heard anyone you know, saying that a school staff wanted to give them services and they weren't sure that they should do that. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the stories that we hear from parents. So if you'll allow me, I wanted to read what happens at Pacer Center is parents call and they leave a message with our front office staff that gives us advocates some information. And then advocates call that parent back. But it allows us to understand the situations that they're dealing with. So I'm just going to read a few of these slips. Um, the first one says, daughter second grade is failing, has trouble focusing, tried to get her an IEP, but scored just above so doesn't qualify. Can't afford to have a neuropsych test done. Right now, school is talking about holding her back, holding her back at the end of this year. The, the interesting thing about this story is it reminds me about Sunny that we heard about earlier. Because when a parent says she scored just above, you might recall that that's one of those 13 categories, the specific learning disabilities, where there's an actual score. There has to be a 1.75 standard deviation difference between your IQ score or your ability levels and where you're performing. So 
I didn't take this call, but as an advocate, I would be saying to this parent, well, I understand that your child didn't qualify for specific learning disabilities. It sounds like that happened. But by the mere fact that the, child, the parent mentioned that the child is struggling with focus leads me to wonder about uh, um, ADHD. And I would probably say to the parent, has anyone mentioned ADHD to you? Do they, they're talking about focus. And the reason why I would ask that is, another one of the 13 categories is other health disabilities. So it seems according to this note that when they finished that evaluation for SLD, the response was, we're done, we tried to evaluate her, she didn't qualify, I'm sorry. But most likely there was no discussion of, do you think she might have ADHD? Is there any history of that in your family? Have you ever had her evaluated? You might want to talk to the pediatrician. And if you get that diagnosis, then come back to us because then we could look at a new category. Um, I had to just tie that to the Sunny case because it seems so um, appropriate. My next slip um, says, daughter, eighth grade, progressive hearing loss, has IEP. She has been so severely bullied at her school that her doctor does not want her to go back. Bullying is physical. They broke her hearing equipment. She gets hockey checked in hallways. Mom wants her to go to another school, but special ed department refuses to let her go. Mom is keeping her home now for her own safety. School is aware of problem, does nothing to stop it. Um, calls like this is what brought us to develop the National Bullying Prevention Center at Pacer Center, because we saw a huge increase in calls like that in 2005, 2005 and they've remained rather consistent. Next slip says, daughter eight, behind in reading. Teachers say it's because she isn't interested in, meeting, in reading. Mom thinks she is dyslexic. What should she do? Where can she go to get some help? Last slip, daughter, 13, anxiety, ADHD, Tourette's. Has asked since she was in kindergarten for an IEP or a 504 plan. School has refused her, looking for help and trying to get her something. So this is just a smattering of slips that I could pick up yesterday to share with you, I made copies of. We talked a little bit about the IEP process. I wanted to point out a couple of things in response. Um, I had already um, mentioned, um, Chair Pratt, that we, most of our calls are, I'm trying to get help for my child, not that they want to give my child help. So as I mentioned, unfortunately, in the 14 years when I was hoping to impact change, there hasn't been a change in that route. And I wanted to talk just briefly about the prior written notice from our perspective. You heard about that earlier, that the schools give it to a parent when they're writing a new IEP. There's another really important reason why our prior written notice is required, and that is when a parent requests something and the school district refuses. Um, we try to encourage parents uh, at Pacer Center to any time they make a request, do it in writing, um, because then it will prompt a response in writing, but that doesn't always happen. And what we see is parents will request things verbally and they'll get a verbal response about why that shouldn't happen. And then we'll get a call from the parent, and parents' tuition is pretty important, and they'll say, the response didn't seem right, so I, run, I wanna run this by you. And our response now, thanks to the prior written notice, is go back to the school and ask them to document their refusal on a prior written notice form. I will tell you that between 75 and 80% of the times when I tell parents to do that, to ask to have it documented in a prior written notice, the school district has a change of heart and they decide not to refuse. And the reason for that is the prior written notice form requires some really important things to be documented. Number one, they have to document what the parent requested. They have to document what other options are available or what options did they consider in addition to what the parent requested. And then lastly, they have to document why they decided to do what they decided to do instead of the other options. Um, so that prior written notice has been an incredibly valuable tool for parents to better understand. We see situations where, for instance, as an example, the school might say, your child is struggling in our school and they, we want them to go to a level four setting because they're struggling. And, and oftentimes the district will have just one level one school, level four school, or they'll go to a cooperative. And the parents will say, what other options are available? And the response will be, there aren't really any other options. 
So you can imagine it would be really tough. School districts would not want to document on a prior written notice form that the only option is a, is a level four setting. Because obviously other options are maybe the services we're providing aren't appropriate. Maybe we need to change the services that we're providing in some way so the student can have more success. So in our field, we really value the prior written notice form and find it to be incredibly beneficial. I also wanted to talk about the time that's allocated for teachers doing paperwork. And I want to make sure that we remember that there is legislation that says that school districts can have support staff doing paperwork, scheduling meetings, even, even writing IEPs. Because what we heard was the flip side of that. Highly qualified special ed teachers are doing that, doing the paperwork. The intention of the legislation was, let's keep those special ed teachers where they need to be with the students. They're the highly qualified staff. And let's have support staff doing the paperwork. And the OLA report of 2013, they applauded several school districts that were indeed doing that, using administrative staff to do that, to help their teaching staff. So I think that's really important. Another important issue that we see as a trend in Minnesota is that we see students with diagnoses, much like my son, where they'll have other diagnoses that are pretty mild. You know, I, I can survive with my tremor and as well as my son and his other disabilities. But when you start throwing in the mental health diagnoses and it becomes a jumble of diagnoses, then these kids become incredibly more complex. We'd like to see them served earlier. Um, and the last thing I want to say about paperwork, um, my co-director at Pacer Center has been with Pacer Center since 1980. She always says, you do the math. <laughs> uh, a long time. She's been at Pacer a long time. And she always says, I remember when there weren't obligations for paperwork. I remember what, that we didn't have accountability and high expectations for children. And it was a disaster. So I just want to make sure that we remember that, that paperwork serves as accountability um, and helps us keep high expectations for children, which I know we all want. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could follow up on, on that issue. So one of the issues we've been talking about is IEP, and some of that's the, the um, paperwork that goes with it. So I'm having a siting project done, and as an attorney, I can tell you this. There are a lot more construction lawsuits than there are special education mm -hmm. lawsuits. And one of the reasons that the trades have not always figured out is let's get on the same page, literally, about what we're going to do and what you're going to pay for. So we go through and we hand write out what's all that going to be. What are they going to do? What kind of siding am I going to have? Are they going to wrap the windows? Are they going to put tie back on? All of that gets written down. Now, even there, we end up with litigation. Now, in special education, when we do the IEP process, I think it's reasonable to expect that we will have some things written down that we're going to confirm what we're going to do. Now, from my own personal experience, sitting through over 50 IEP meetings in my life, what typically happens is all of what Mace described. There will be some evaluation and testing to see if they qualified. It was kind of a no-brainer with my autistic son. He didn't speak. He's not toilet trained. He doesn't speak today, and he's, I've never heard him say my name, and he's 21 years old. He's going to qualify for special education services, and then once we have the testing done that says, yeah, he's not talking, he's not passing any of those tests, let's write up a program, what we're going to do to try to teach him to communicate. What are we going to do? Now, Mace and the professionals come in, they have some ideas. I'm a parent, I don't really have an idea. How are we going to teach them? But they do. So we write it down on what we're going to do over the next year and what's the program going to be. Now, the law allows some flexibility. When we find out three, four months into it, it's not working, let's figure out something else. They shoot us an email. We get a handwritten note. We used to keep just a spiral notebook. So we'd write down and send in to the school with this backpack, here's what he ate for breakfast. Is this any meds that we've given to him? Write me back a note if you've given him a med in particular. I need to know what meds he's had during the day. What do you have for lunch? Did he eat? Any signs or any issues so that we can communicate back and forth? Sometimes we'll text to the teachers. A lot of the special education administrators don't like us just texting with their teachers. Um, but we'll email or we'll just have that spiral notebook to communicate. We have the flexibility to make changes in that IEP. 
One of the issues he asked us to talk about is assistive technology as part of the IEP process. Let me phrase it a little bit differently. We considered assistive technology and how we could use it to teach our children. And what I will continue to emphasize for this body as it considers bold initiatives that will keep us number one in the country is going to be technology. It is clearly what it is all about right now. And for Minnesota to continue to lead, we need to embrace how assistive technology can help teach our children, make it more efficient and have better outcomes. It's the one thing that's not being talked about. We talk about paperwork, well, an iPad can take care of a lot of that. We talk about assistive technology for communication, an iPad does the trick. The apps that are available now on an iPad for only a couple hundred bucks are really inexpensive and they work, especially with children that have communication issues. Um, May spoke a lot about specific learning disability and I know when the, uh, the Department of Ed spoke on July 24th, they have a pie chart that they pulled up, which I brought with me, and it showed that was 23% of the children we're talking about receiving special ed. If you look at the other 75% of the children that could be benefited by an iPad, we can do amazing things with technology. So that is one of the things we considered in our IEP. Now I want to go one step further. My two things I wanted to emphasize for this body to consider to be bold initiatives, uh, technology and, and then the uh, and the second one is, where do you get the revenue for it? I, I watched you on video, and I know Senator Clausen asked this question. There are some children that are so severe, it just seemed like there should have been Medicaid dollars available. That's a brilliant idea. We know the federal government gave this state a mandate. It's a good mandate, but they also promised us 40% revenue. They're never, ever going to give us that 40%. But one way that we can take a bold initiative to help generate more revenue is to do either third party payer, get the health insurance to pay for it, or to get MA to pay for it. That iPad could easily be paid for for a couple hundred bucks with the Medicaid dollars that are available. We get a real secure case for it because it's going to be tossed around. I guarantee you my son would go, he's bitten a few of them, broken the screen. We can use that, and then we use that for a communication app. Imagine the difference we make, and we cut a ton of taxpayer dollars by making it more efficient. So as part of the IEP process, we were not using assistive technology to communicate with our teachers, but we were sitting down and we were talking about what technology is available to help teach them that are going to be more efficient and more effective. So um, let me just say that at Pacer Center, we do a training called the ABCs of the IEP. It's a beautiful training. It's very interactive. Parents bring their own child's IEP. And so we go through the sections of the IEP and explain what that should look like. And then the parents have the opportunity to look at their own child's IEP. When we get to the assistive technology section, we will ask parents, how many of you have had that conversation about assistive technology and tools that could benefit your child? Um, because there are, are boxes that you can check. One is, yes, the child needs assistive technology, and then you write what they do. The second is, no, the child doesn't need assistive technology at this time. There is an inference that the IEP team has had a discussion about that. And then lastly, there is sometimes an option that they could try to find more data to decide whether or not it's appropriate. Not all school districts use that third option. When we ask parents about how many of them have had that discussion, very few of them. Uh, most recently, I did a training, and there were 45 parents there in the audience, and one said, that, that she was involved in the discussions related to assistive technology. Most times the professionals will say, we've considered assistive technology, but we don't think that anything is viable at this time. As a parent, we don't know, and we're trusting the professionals. So um, at Pacer Center, we tr have tried to do a lot of training about assistive technology through our Assignment Technology Center, and we have a video that we'd like to share with you. Um, that I think Sarah will queue up. Oh, and before we do that, let's, we thought we'd talk about some of um, pieces of assistive technology because we want you to understand some of these options can be very low tech. The ladies are giving you uh, pencil grips. Um, I have, I use a pen because of my tremor disorder that has a pencil grip built into that. So some of these you can buy on your own easily. 
Um, and those pencil grips are very inexpensive, a couple, couple dollars, under three, under five for sure. We also wanted to be sure that we highlighted, you'll see this in the video, but there is a recording pen that students can click a button and use specialized paper and they can take notes or they can doodle whatever they want to do. And while the teacher is doing a lecture, whatever they're writing, they, they will record, this pen will record what the teacher's saying at that time. It holds hours of notes on here. And then the children can go back and push their pen to this, any spot on the paper, and they will hear the teacher's lecture from this pen. Um, they can put in some headphones and do it as well. We'll let you listen. So, yeah. My hobbies are that I like taking stuff apart, playing video games, okay. and messing around with my brother. I like th taking things apart because I like seeing how things work. My name is Brody, and I am going into sixth grade. I use two assistive technologies at school. The first one is CoWriter. It's a word prediction program. You start typing a word, it tries to predict what you're typing. The other assistive technology that I use is the smart pen. It's basically a recorder. I learned about co-writer from Mr. my old OT, Mr. Summoner. He thought that it would be good for me. I tried it and it was. My name is Annette Serretta and I'm the Assistive Technology Specialist and Occupational Therapist here at Northfield Public Schools. Co-writer is a type of what they refer to yes. as a word prediction program. So yes. you've probably seen it when you're on the internet and you start to type a word in and it will try to suggest a word for you that it thinks you're trying to spell. Well, that that's what word prediction is. And so Brody uses a program that's much exactly. more elaborate than what you would use. The reason why CoreWriter is helpful to me is because I have trouble spelling words. Core makes spelling words easier because it tries to predict the word that you are typing. The LiveScribe is sometimes called the smart pen. It records as you write. So as, let's say you were taking notes in a class, as you took your notes, it would record the teacher giving the lecture. And then when you're done with your notes, you can go back to them, touch your pen on that paper where you wrote the note, and it would play the recording of what was being said at that time when you were taking those notes. I'm going to play a recording. Talk about so skip to that part that you loaded. He also used the pen to record what he was saying to write his own papers. Instead of writing an entire paragraph, I can record it quickly for later. He had these great ideas, but it, the spelling kind of slowed him down and got in his way. So he would record his thoughts uh, using the pen and then go sit down at the computer and basically transcribe them and type them out onto the computer to create his assignments. I would record class, my thoughts, and my idea. Brody as a student was very bright and had really good ideas. It was really difficult for him to get them down in paper pencil form. And the assistive technology really opened up um, his possibility for getting his ideas down in written form. And it just streamlined the process for him. And he was more motivated to write. Guys, I hope that was helpful, but I gotta go meet my brother on the Xbox 360. Yeah. Miss Manning. Um, because of our technical difficulties, is there a, a link that people can go to see that video? Sure, we will be sure to send that to you. Okay. We'd be happy to. Thank you. Yeah. Of course, we would send you to pacer.org. You'll yeah. find it there. It's, it's on our website. Okay, yeah, well, there, and there that's, and that's what I want for the people you sitting in the audience that didn't There's have a chance to see it. Yeah. So the video's on pacer.org, thank you. Yes, yeah, and there are many other ones of students using assistive technology. Um, I also want to say that PACER does um, assistive technology consultations for free to parents, so it's something that we offer to try to help schools and parents bridge that gap of recognizing what uh, assistive technology might be beneficial. 
So, um, and to answer, so the two things I was leaving you with for bold initiatives is finding new dollars from, from Medicaid, and the second is using assistive technology. So on the Department of Education uh, has a list of IEP related, health related services that are eligible for MA, physical therapy, occupational therapy, assistive technology. Mm -hmm. Those devices are listed as medical equipment that can be reimbursed by those federal dollars that are so hard to get out of them from that mandate they gave us. It seems like that is a brilliant idea that this, that we should be following up on. We can both get assistive technology and we can get federal dollars to help pay for them. That should help as we try to balance um, and, and balance the dollars between special ed and general ed dollars. Yeah, those uh, in the state of Minnesota, those um, third-party billing dollars is what, it, what it's referred to as third-party billing, um, are significantly underutilized. Um, school districts aren't doing the paperwork and trying to get the funding through using that source. And again, we also want you to keep in mind that they could have administrative staff as a habit do that for all children. Um, as we know, it's much easier to do th uh, chores and obligations if there's some repetition. So if you had one person in your district doing the applications to try to do third-party billing, you'd probably have greater success. Our Health Information Center developed a handout on third-party billing, and I'd love to share this with you as well so you can see the process and what's available to us but not being used as much as possible. Do we have any questions for Ms. Manning or Mr. McNeil? Yes, Senator Hoff. I'm interested, the, um, you touched base, and thank you, uh, Don, about the, we have settled law. I mean, we really do, and, and thank you for your conversation about your past efforts, and, and we go back 14 years, and there's another attorney who also is now a judge who was doing what you're doing, and, and I appreciate could you um, really highlight the, the, your past, and you have that sheet, and I hope you share it with all of us, the, the work that, that you've done in that. But I, I'm also interested in, in Ms. Manning, you could highlight um, not just about the settled law, Don, but then also the three reasons, the three top reasons you're getting calls at Pacer Center. You had mentioned you're getting 1,200 phone calls a month, right? Mm -hmm. And so what are, the, what are those in, and I'm trying to think how this system, because Senator Anderson and I were sitting here looking at the grid that our, uh, it's GRED. She used an acronym, I had to sit here and think, what the heck is SCRED, but I got it, St. Croix. Um, and, and we were like, wow, the system has just become not what it was intended to be in 1975, which was based upon due process rights. It was based upon lawsuits and families saying this is wrong, right? And, and so we have settled law. We already know that. So I guess help us understand what are the three, who are the three top phone calls that we're getting of those 1,200 a month? And, and if, Don, if you could share with us, you know, this whole discussion about we are above and beyond anybody else when it comes to the due press rights of the alternative dispute resolution process and conciliation. Thank you for your work on that. New York City, you have to file due process before you go anywhere else on that. Minnesota has that extra step in there. That's a cost savings mm -hmm. for districts. So can you guys just help me finish that conversation and I'll be done. I can talk about our top three calls because we look at this. We have a database and we can kind of look at what the data tells us. Um, the three top reasons that people call are refusing evaluation or seeking help and not getting help. So refusing evaluation or refusing a, a 504 plan or the 504 plan isn't working. Um, not following the IEP, so parents feel that the staff have the IEP but they're not following it. Um, and then the number three reason why we get calls most often is because the child is struggling and the parents don't know what to do about it. They're just seeking some advice or some help um, because even though their child has an IEP, they're struggling uh, in school still. Mr. Chair, thank you. It sounds like, Mr. Chair, the technical assistance that we hear about, SCRED talk about, and districts needing, we also need that in, in regarding if a child is struggling, what is, where is the TA that's provided in that? Refusing to follow an IEP or refusing to even allow an evaluation, I would like to even go deeper and to find out 
if those children were in the category, 13 categorical disabilities and districts are refusing to even identify, assess, and evaluate, now you're starting to talk about violation of due process rights. And, and so um, we don't have the time to get you know, involved in that, but this has been some good conversation. Thank you, too, for, for coming and sharing your experience. So a quick question. You talked about assistive technology and the, and the ability to, to build that back to third-party payers. Uh, this is going to sound like a very, very basic question, but um, do I have to have an IEP in order to qualify for that reimbursement? Or uh, if I were on a 504 plan, it, maybe I just need a, a pencil holder or uh, an iPad app. Um, or do those qualify without me? Act if, if I didn't score low enough to be on the, uh, for special ed services, can I still get reimbursement back for those assistive technologies to help my student uh, succeed? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I'm not 100% certain of that, but I believe that you most, I believe that you should be able to. Um, and students can have a 504 plan and get accommodations. Um, there are a number of kids who get accommodations of assistive technology or the use of an iPad. So I would assume that if they're MA, that they certainly would be able to get that. Um, but I'm not certain. So, Mr. Chair, so maybe I can ask, answer that in more practical terms. The answer no. is typically we, the, the horse goes first, so we, we qualify for special education services, which means that the, yeah. in order to be eligible for MA, they consider that, say, oh, you've already had an IEP, oh, then yeah. you must be da disabled, which is, makes it easier to, to apply and get those dollars. Now, there's a difference between MA dollars and then private insurance dollars, yeah. and some of the parents are gonna be reluctant to use private insurance dollars. At one point, there is a lifetime cap, right? It's mm -hmm. not there now, but we're waiting for Congress to figure out what we're going to do about our health care system. That is one of the issues that's Thank at you. play. There's deductibles and co-pays that are at play, and there's probably an expert You've here that's help. going to answer that question. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome, Mr. Cordy. You've been very patient today. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Darren Cordy, Assistant Commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Education. I'm definitely not an expert in this area, but I can say that um, IEP, assistive technology related to an IEP service is a reimbursable expense under MA, but not if you are not a student with a disability. So if you do not have an IEP, that would not be something mm -hmm. that under Minnesota state MA plan, which is administered by the Department of Human Services, would be an allowable reimbursable expense. The federal government has issued some guidance, I believe it was two or three years ago, that says that states are able to do that, but at this point we, we haven't updated our state plan to allow that. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Cordy, going back to my example of my son, where we where we put him on a 504 plan with some accommodations versus going into uh, an, a full blown IEP, had he gone into an IEP and needed assist, assistive technology, maybe it was as simple as a pencil holder um, that would not have been covered. But had we put him in the full blown IEP, we could have got the pencil holder or maybe an iPad app or something else that helped him through that brain injury then uh, qualify. And so that really became the trigger of whether or not uh, he qualified for third party payments or not. Mr. Chair, that's correct that it, you know, once you have that IEP in place, the, the federal regulations as well as the state MA plan make it clear that any assistive technology related to those IEP services would be reimbursable if you were MA eligible. Um, but until you have that IEP, they would not be. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you. And, and Darren, stay there, because the, the, uh, the, I, I really, you, you start to go on, it, when you see one MA medical assistance plan for a state, you've seen one medical yeah. assistance plan for a state. And so yeah. a, a simple fix, we have individual health plans, which is registered within, you have 504s, IHPs, and IEPs, right, under the IHP. Um, I think there's a, a, a real simple fix to this is to, is to add the component of IHP or a 504 to be um, accepted under the medical assistance plan that Minnesota does. And so um, I, there's an action item for us right there. You see some heads shaking. Um, that's a simple statutory fix or a simple add it in. Because again, you've seen one state with an MA plan, you've seen another. Am I misreading that stuff, Darren? Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Hoffman, I, I think those would be good questions for the Department of Human Services, to be honest, because they really do administer the state's um, MA plan. 
Um, so I, I would encourage you to have that conversation with uh, our colleagues over there. Well, Senator Hoppen, I think you've hit exactly on, on, on why we're having these hearings is that uh, there are going to be a lot of ideas coming out of them. Uh, really is to make sure that we all have a good baseline. We understand where we're at both uh, legally, but all, uh, maybe the state of special ed or the, the uh, of, of where we're at. Um, so I, I, I appreciate that and, and there'll be time for, uh, for ideas and fixes. Um, Fiscal notes, the whole bit. So, uh, I'm not committing. I'm not committing to any any direction, <laughs> as my colleague is trying to push me in a certain <laughs> direction. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I've, yeah. So, I'm sorry. We didn't mean to interrupt. Did Did you have anything no. else? Any other questions for our testifiers? Well, thank you very thank much. You. Um, thank you for your time. Like I say, I was, I was very impressed with the work that you're doing and uh, appreciate the story and the parents' perspective. We'd love um, to see you out there. Yeah. Come well, down to Bloomington we'll, and see we'll us. try to make that happen.